twice to be an astronaut and now have two generic rejection postcards from NASA. Um, but I've spent my whole life dreaming about space. I grew up counting the stars and watching the space station pass overhead and pondering one of the great existential questions of whether or not there's other life out there. Even though NASA wouldn't let me go muck around in space, I still decided to pursue a career in rocket science. And now, through some unexpected twists and turns, I run a rocket science company of about 30 human employees. And I point out that they're human because this means that they come with 30 unique personalities and sets of emotions and aspirations. And now, by direct comparison, I can honestly tell you I'm not sure which part is harder, the rocket science or these other parts of life. Uh, so for some perspective, here's an ion engine. It's used for maneuvering spacecraft like satellites and interplanetary probes in space, and it's different from the rocket used to launch them into orbit. A neutral gas like xenon is injected into the ionization chamber. And separately, a high energy stream of electrons is also injected into that chamber. And the job of those electrons is to find and collide with one of those neutral atoms and form an ion. Now, hopefully, some fraction of those newly ionized particles make it to the downstream grids where they're accelerated out the back of the spacecraft, producing thrust. Ion engines like these, this demonstrates fundamentally the conservation of momentum. Stuff shooting out the back of the rocket or engine pushes the spacecraft forward. And this is rocket science. To produce that thrust, a delightful combination of quantum and plasma physics, thermodynamics, and electrostatics had to occur. But you know what I didn't have to do to produce that thrust? My own taxes, or output from a, a laptop with only USB-C. <laughs> Ion engines like this were first developed in the 1950s. At this time, satellites were large, and the primary users were the governments of wealthy countries like the US, Russia, and China, and a few commercial companies like Time Life and HBO. Toward the, the end of the 20th century, the tides of technology development like Moore's Law and the internet swept up the satellite industry, and the average size of a satellite went from about 3,000 kilograms in 1970 to less than 800 kilograms today. But this is just mass. This isn't the reason this is exciting. This is exciting because over that same time period, the number of countries launching satellites increased exponentially as a direct result. Smaller satellites are cheaper to manufacture and cheaper to launch and are opening up space to more countries and organizations around the world. Now, space is not just the setting of a science fiction novel or the inner machinations of Elon Musk's brain. Uh, in, in one sense, it's actually very Earth-centric. It's just another place to put sensors and modems that collect important data about our planet and connect everyone on it. For example, early results from a new type of warning system suggest that satellite data from satellite data on uh, soil moisture, terrain, and weather can be used to predict malaria outbreaks. And this is a picture of a wildfire taken from space that can be used to help firefighters predict changes in fire direction. Small satellites are the catalyst for humans to look more to the skies every day. From developing uh, new drugs in a zero-gravity environment to sending tiny chipsets to the nearest star to learn more about our origins and the universe. This stuff will become the stuff of our children's day jobs and not just Hollywood. One thing I'd argue that most, if not all, spacecraft need is some sort of engine for maneuvering when they're in orbit. So let's take the Apollo 11 mission flight profile to prepare you for the upcoming Ryan Gosling film. <laughs> the Apollo spacecraft <laughs> blasted off on top of a Saturn V rocket on July 16, 1969. The thrust for that Saturn V was produced from five F1 engines. But once in orbit, 
The spacecraft used a, com used a completely different engine to enter into a translunar injection orbit, and then to enter into a lunar orbit and eventually a descent to the moon, it used yet another engine, the engine of the service module. Now, the typical use case for a small sat with propulsion is a little bit different, but it's critical nonetheless. Small satellites are typically launched in groups of 10 to 20 satellites on one rocket. They need an engine to space themselves out along their orbit to perform their mission. Then over the lifetime of their mission, they need to be able to correct for perturbations like in the gravity field, and they need to maneuver to avoid colliding with debris. Then, at the end of their mission, they need to burn to re-enter re Earth's atmosphere to avoid becoming debris themselves. Now, unfortunately, and of course there's an unfortunately, the promise of small sats has highlighted a big gap in their capabilities. There are no suitable electric engines at these scales today. So sometimes the problem is actually rocket science. So let's say we want to take this Prius-sized ion engine and shrink it down to fit on a dorm room mini fridge-sized satellite. Primarily, what we have to do is shrink the ionization chamber. When we shrink the ionization chamber, we actually reduce the amount of time those neutral atoms and those electrons spend in the chamber before they exit out the other side. That reduces the likelihood that they find and collide with one another and even create an ion in the first place. So if we shrink the size of the engine and the ionization chamber, we decrease the residence time, we decrease the ionization fraction, therefore we decrease the thrust, and overall we decrease the effectiveness of this even working as an engine in the first place. So the status quo is that people have been launching small sats without any propulsion. They want to launch them so badly that they send them up without it. And this is problematic for several reasons. A small satellite without propulsion can't stay in orbit long enough to perform its mission before it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere prematurely and turns into a fiery ball of aluminum. It can't reach its ideal orbit or move to another and it can't maneuver to avoid colliding with debris. During a visit to a new space startup that had launched its first three or four satellites, I saw this firsthand. I was standing with them in their mission control room, checking out the new software they had built in-house for tracking what would become their hundreds of satellites on orbit. And they had received an alert from the Air Force a couple weeks prior that they were on a likely collision path with a piece of space debris. So you know what they did? Nothing. Um, their satellites didn't have propulsion on board, so we just stood in the control room and held our breaths and hoped that it wouldn't collide. And it didn't, but that's not the point. Uh, the point is, is that without propulsion, small sats can't reach their potential. Many of the businesses and organizations that want to use space can't. And this is the problem I've been working on now for over half of my life small-scale propulsion to enable the small sat industry. I met my human co-founder on the first day of grad school, and we started working on a new type of engine, one that would use a liquid propellant. And in fact, the liquid was already ionized, so we didn't have to spend the energy to do that on orbit. We didn't need to store a gas in a complex pressure vessel with bulky pumps and valves. We didn't need to use an external neutralizing cathode to neutralize the ion beam. Basically, we made it simple and elegant. Conceptually, here's how the technique works. The propellant, an ionic liquid, is transmitted to the tip of a microemitter structure like a capillary. A voltage is applied between the capillary and a grid that's not shown in the image, and that sets up an electric field. The electric field stresses the liquid, pulling on it and deforming it. Eventually, the electric field exactly balances the surface tension of the liquid, the restoring force. And at that equilibrium, the electric field is intensified, and a jet of ions bursts from the tip. That jet of ions carries mass, and it's moving at a very fast velocity, thereby producing thrust to push the spacecraft. Most of this magic happens here in one of these chips. 
On this chip, there are 480 of those microemitter structures. The gold grid facing you has 480 corresponding holes through which the ions are accelerated. One to hundreds of these chips are arranged on the face of a satellite, and those are attached to the propellant tanks, and the tanks and the power supply system receive input, command, and power from the spacecraft. At strong signals from the industry, and with what was hopefully a healthy dose of delusion, we decided to form the company to commercialize the technology. We believed we could get this into the world faster than an established defense contractor because of how radically different it was. And this technology actually promises to have a power density, which is how much power per chip you can squeeze out of it, that's higher than any other electric engine known today. So one day, we hope to build bigger versions of these that can decrease the transfer time to Mars and beyond. Now, obviously, there are a lot of challenges that can come along with trying to introduce a liquid into a tiny electrical device. So I don't know this poor fellow I found on the internet, but I know how he feels. <laughs> the challenges that arise when you introduce a liquid propellant into an electric engine are not unlike those that happen when you spill a glass of water on your laptop and have to put it in rice. So my co-founder took on that part, the rocket science, and I turned to the business to learn how to fund the organization, form partnerships, and try to figure out on the fly how to build a team that together could do things that apart we could not. So we've been working on research and development and product development for the past four years. And our first engine is finally on the launch pad in New Zealand going up next month. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. And when you ask the CEO of that company, the launch company, what the hardest part of starting his business has been, he would tell you it was creating a new agreement with the government of New Zealand to be able to launch um, from New Zealand. He said that he had to attend town hall meetings and sing with the locals before they could move forward. <laughs> so again, not the, not the rocket science. The satellite that is carrying our system was itself built by tiny humans, like these three on the left. The Irvine High School District in Irvine, California, has a program where high school students every year build design, build, and launch a small sat. And they have plans to build 10 small sats over the next 10 years. So to me, this picture and that program really sum up how accessible space is becoming. Building a satellite is now a high school homework project. <clears throat> so hopefully, from my perspective, you've seen how rocket science can be elegant and accessible, or at the very least, is based on physical laws. But for my new role, my new uncomfortable role, <laughs> uh, managing people, developing them, and motivating them, really all I have to turn to is stuff psychologists say, like how the best predictor of future human behavior is the past. Well, thankfully, in the space industry, for small sats, in our species exploration of the final frontier, the future is already shaping up to be nothing like the past. Thank you.